and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1, our text is verses 18 through 20. I just want to let you know in advance, uh, there's exposition in this message. There's also a lot of practical stuff. It's, it's a very kind of down-to-earth message. Uh, just I sat before the Lord asking for his help, and this is what he gave me. And so I was just convinced. In fact, even after the 830 service, just the encouragement I received, a lot of people said that it really, the message really hit home. And so we're in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. I, in fact, when I was preparing for the message, and I first sat before the text, and I just, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. And I went and I read and listened to some other preachers that uh, did this particular passage. And after I listened to them, I thought they, don't, they didn't know either what to do with it. <laughs> but, but then really the Holy Spirit laid something on my heart that I'm absolutely convinced. And I hope you'll listen to I hope I hope if your cell phone is on, uh, if you're tempted to text or anything like that, put it aside. Put it aside. Uh, just put yourself before the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. Don't let anything get in the way today of the message, because I really think that we all need to hear this. It's very important. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may fight the good fight, keeping the faith and a good conscience which some have rejected, and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered over to Satan, so that they should not should so that they should be taught not to blaspheme. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father God, Lord, just as we're before you, Lord, I'm just going to ask Father that something special is going to take place in the service through the preaching and teaching of your word, Lord. I, I do pray, Father, there might be somebody here who doesn't know you. There may be many here that know you, but they need this message, and they may not even realize they need it. The Bible is ever so clear. It says that Satan blinds the minds of the unbelieving, and unfortunately, even at times, he does that to believers as well uh, when they allow themselves to be confused and brought into deception and delusion. And the Bible even talks about, Father, how there, is, there are spirits of delusion that, that can keep believers from knowing the truth the way, the way it really is in your word. So, Lord, I'm going to pray for all of us. Pray for your anointing, Lord, for the Holy Spirit's anointing. And, Father, I just really do pray that nothing will, will interrupt now in our service, Lord, that, that nothing's going to happen that's going to get in the way of the message coming out. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This morning I want to talk to you about the high cost of dropping your guard. That's actually the title, if you looked on the back of your program, that's the title I gave the message today because that really summarizes what I want to talk about this morning. Years ago, best-selling author and a very well-known radio personality, in fact, probably some of you listened to him on the radio, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, once wrote a book that sold millions. It's still really a big selling book called Dropping Your Guard. Maybe some of you have read that. Now when he talks about dropping your guard in that particular book, he's going in a direction I'm not going, but in that book he talks about taking off the mask that we sometimes wear that hides our true selves. Swindoll in that book talks about the importance as, uh, uh, as believers of being transparent or honest in our relationships with others. And, and I totally agree with that. But when I think of the phrase, dropping your guard, I tend to think of it in terms of a negative connotation. For example, if you've ever been in a boxing match, we were joking this morning with our elderly Ed Chatterton, because Ed had a history and he loved to use his fist when he needed to when he was a young feller. But if you drop your fist in the midst of a boxing match, most likely your opponent is going to drop you with a crushing blow. You see, dropping your guard can be dangerous. Or if any of you guys played football, or, or gals as well, but you were 
a blocker on the line, your whole responsibility is to protect the quarterback, but for whatever reason, you take your eye off the guy who's just across from you breathing threats, telling you he intends to pound you into the turf. But if you take your eye off of him at just the right moment, you might find yourself flat on your back with a concussion. Where spiritually speaking, dropping your guard can be especially dangerous if it comes at the high cost of falling into sin or even falling away from the faith. Are you following me? And many years ago, I was sitting in a church service. I wasn't the pastor at this church, but I was sitting in the church service where you all are, and uh, not at this church, but somewhere else, and a man was preaching that particular Sunday, and this man was the father of a guy that I had gone to college with. His son was an incredibly talented guy, extremely smart. I don't know if he ever got less than an A in his entire life. He was also, unfortunately, a very good-looking guy as well. He's just a great guy. This guy, had he was the package, all right? He was also a very gifted musician, and he had studied under a renowned pianist. I heard later that, uh, that he had gotten married, and getting married, he had children. He went on to an Ivy League school, I think it was Harvard, where he earned his doctorate. It seemed as if he had everything together. And, and so hearing his father preach that Sunday, I thought, I can't wait to after the service. I want to go up and ask him, so, so, so what's your son doing these days? And so I went up to his dad, and I was completely blown away by what his father told me. He told me that his son, unfortunately, had not only walked away from his marriage to live with another woman somewhere in Europe, but he had also walked away from his faith in the process. And the thing of it was that he and his wife had actually gone to Europe as missionaries. And while they were on the mission field, he felt a temptation and began a relationship with another woman that eventually ended his marriage and really ended his walk with the Lord. You see, this incredibly talented, smart, good-looking guy a pastor's son, for whatever reason, had dropped his guard. There's another fellow that comes to mind. I just want to share some of these illustrations, these stories with you. There's another guy that I used to be really close to in Bible college. We were both preparing for the ministry. We were both listened to each other preach. We practiced on, on each other. Uh, we were involved in, in, our, in, our, in our weddings together. And, well, over time, we eventually... Uh, you know, distance and all like that. We hadn't spoken to each other in a long time. And, well, when I ended up down here, I, one day I just picked up the phone and reconnected with him. And as our conversation was going along, it was a nice conversation. I just happened to say to him, well, you know what? If you ever come down to LBI, why don't you come to, come to Grace Calvary and, and, and join, us, you know, join us for a worship service? To me, it just seemed like, you know, the natural thing to ask, right? And he, and he replied to me when I, when I said that. He says, Why? Are you trying to make me go to church? And I, I was completely dumbfounded by his comment because this was a guy who actually had been on a pastoral staff at one time. And I wondered what had happened. Had perhaps somewhere along the way, somewhere along the way, he dropped his guard. When I, when I moved down here almost nine years ago now, um, I had gone to Christian school back in 8th, 9th, and 10th grade over in Burlington County at, at that time, and I had heard about a reunion. I didn't get to go to it, but I heard that there was a, a guy, a friend of mine, that we had gone to school together, a really nice guy, and uh, we connected on the phone, and we, we both agreed we would meet up for lunch down, down in the direction of Beach Haven. I hadn't seen him in 30 years, and he still looked great, and I still look like how I look now, but anyway... You know, we got together, we sat down to lunch, I asked if we could have a word of prayer for the meal together, and, and, and we began to eat together, have great conversation. I talked to him about, you know, what my life has been and where I've been all these years, and about family, wife, children, and all like that. And then he began to tell me about his life, he began to tell me about how he was involved in church, he was married, and uh, he was involved in youth ministry, and how he had become really involved in music ministry, because apparently he's a, a gifted guitarist. 
And then he began to tell me about how while well he was involved in this church and youth ministry and, and, and worship ministry, that he began a relationship with another lady in the church and how now that eventually caused not only her marriage to fall apart, but his marriage to fall apart. And now on top of it, as he was talking to me that day, he said, we're both living together at this time. What happened? Somewhere along the way, he dropped his guard. And the sad thing, really the sick thing is, I could fill up the rest of my message time this morning and just go on and probably if I opened it up to the floor in the room, we could all probably tell enough stories to fill up the whole day. And I really do believe that when Paul writes to Timothy in the verses 18 and the first part of 19, if you look there again, he says to him, This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience. Church, family, what was Paul really warning Timothy not to do? And this is the principle that I think applies to every one of us in this room, that when it comes to maintaining your spiritual vitality, don't drop your guard. You'll notice he tells Timothy that this is a command. In the King James Version, it uses the word charge. I understand the NIV translates it instruction, and I understand it could be translated that way, but it's more than an instruction. This is now Paul reaching out to Timothy and saying, Timothy, in your own spiritual life, this is something that you better do. In fact, he mentions to Timothy that he's entrusting him with this command, and earlier he had used the word entrust, though it's a deep, different uh, Greek word. He refers to how Paul refers how God had entrusted the gospel to him, meaning it was something of great value. And now Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, I want to tell you something that I want it to weigh upon your mind. I want it to weigh upon your heart. It, it, it's, it's as if to say that, to Timothy, Timothy, I want you to hear what I'm going to say. And what I'm going to tell you is you're in the midst of a spiritual warfare. It's not going to end until the day you step into God's presence. And while you're still, still here on planet Earth, you're going to have to maintain this fight. And the way I'm stating it this morning is you're going to have to be careful not to drop your guard. I remember years ago when I was going through seminary, and, you know, they teach you a lot of stuff, and a lot of it's very heady stuff. But there was one thing that whenever this subject came up in chapels or in classroom, it, I mean, it always got my attention. The professor or whoever it was speaking would say, Gentlemen, the enemy's after you. Don't drop your guard. Because Satan would sift you like wheat. And I'm going to imagine and believe this weekend that there may be some, even in our service right now, and even in hearing this part of this message, what's already going on in your life right now is that Satan is presently sifting you like wheat. But I want to tell you something. When those men used to warn us about not dropping our guard, it never made me angry. But I tell you what it did do. It always scared me to death. And do you know, even preaching this, week, this message this weekend and, and the theme of this message, it still scares me. And I hope it still scares me right up until the last day I die. Because I know that that's what the enemy wants to do. And I know that's why Paul was telling Timothy, Timothy, you've got to fight the good fight. Because you are in the midst of a battle. And I sincerely believe, and you know it too, because the Holy Spirit's testifying with your spirit that the things that I'm saying are true. You know that if you drop your guard, you know what he's going to do. It's like leaving. Can you imagine if you opened your front door, you unlocked it, you left your house, and on the, in the process, you put a sign on the front door, not on, just on the front door, but out the street, and you said, all thieves are welcome. I've left my house unlocked, the door's wide open, come on in. Well, you wouldn't do that. 
But you know, that's what we are doing when we drop our spiritual guard. We are pretty much leaving the front door wide open and inviting the enemy to come in. And when he comes in, you know what he's going to do. Spiritual, dropping your spiritual guard is a sure way of allowing the enemy to sucker punch you in the face. It's a sure way of allowing the enemy to punch you in the stomach and the to knock the spiritual vitality, the life right out of you. Paul, when he tells Timothy, you have to fight the good fight, he's telling Timothy, this is a fight that never stops. This is a fight that's going to go on your entire life. The forces of darkness are going to constantly come after you. They're going to constantly come after you. You heard me pray this morning about the spirit of delusion. I've seen Christians caught up in delusion. I've seen Christians who have fallen into sin, and because they have fallen into sin and have given themselves over to that sin, the enemy has convinced them that what they're doing is okay when they're really in the midst of living a lie. I remember years ago in the first church I pastored, I had parents, they brought a young lady to me. She was involved in a wrong relationship with another man. And she said these words to me when I asked her about it. She says, but pastor, I, I love him. But you know, love doesn't make things right. But you see, that's what the enemy does when we drop our guard. Have you ever noticed how Satan has this amazing bag of tricks to try to get people not to fight the good fight? There's lots of ways we could illustrate this. I, I think, for example, of our toys. What am I talking about? Well, you know, there's things that are fun. We could have boats, cars, motorcycles, Harleys, whatever. These things at first can become a pleasurable holiday, right? A, a, a hobby, a, sorry, the things that we like to do, right? We have fun with, whatever it is. But, you know, it can also become like getting hooked on PlayStation or Xbox. It can become an obsession, and soon enough, your spiritual disciplines can begin to fall away. We can drop our guard in relationships, can't we? You know, you can begin a, a respectable friendship with someone of the opposite sex. And they're married and you're married and, and uh, you both seem okay with your marriages. But then one day you, you kind of notice something has changed. And the spirits speaking to your spirit, saying to you, something has changed here. You're, this isn't quite right. The warning flags go up. What do you do? Do you drop your guard? You know, a, a guy or a gal gives you a glance, and even though you're single, and you love the attention, but you know God has already warned you not to pursue that person because you would be unequally yoked. You see, Satan has this amazing bag of tricks. You may be even trying to do something good. You might be trying to help somebody. But God might have said to you, but that's a relationship. No matter how kind you wanted to be and how involved or helpful you wanted to be, that's a place that you don't need to go. You don't need to be there. You see, Satan has so many ways of working his way in. He could even use people's careers. Uh, someone could, you, you may work for years to build your career, but suddenly that career takes over your life and you begin to spend less time with family, less time with your spouse and with your children. There, there's so many ways the enemy can work his way in. There's a, there's a, a young fellow in our service, and I, I, when I first came here, what, he wasn't much taller than than probably my knee, well, maybe a little higher than that, but I always in, enjoyed, because he would come to my office door, and he would look in the lower window and peek in me, at me, and I knew that he wanted to come in and get a hug, and we would have our hugs together, and, and over time, he's gotten a little bit taller, and for most of the time, he fit underneath my armpit, and so I used to stick him under my stinky armpit and just kind of rub it in there a little bit, but I always, I always would say to him, I, I would say to him, I'd ask him this question, are you on the straight and narrow? And he would always look up at me. You, th you know, he'd look up and his eye, you know, what else am I going to say, right? <laughs> Pastor's asking me. Yes, Pastor. You know, 
Right. Now today he's over my shoulder. I can't put him under my armpit anymore, but I still ask him, are you on the straight and narrow? And the reason I do is, is because I know the enemy wants to sift him just like everyone else like wheat. I know the enemy wants to take the young people in our church who are growing up and sift them like wheat. I know the enemy wants to take our young adults and turn them away from the things that were once delivered to them by their parents and by their, their teachers who spoke into their lives about the right way with God. You see, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, you remember the prophecies that were made concerning you? And as I looked in First and Second Timothy, in First Timothy chapter 4, there might be a reference to this. In First Timothy 4, 13 and 14, Paul says to Timothy, until I come... Give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Don't neglect the spiritual gift that was, that's within you, which was bestowed upon you by the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery or by the elders, or shall we just say by the, by the leaders of that church. Paul was warning Timothy, he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, in your life, don't be sidetracked from what God has called you and created you to be. You might remember at the beginning of this letter, Paul had said to Timothy, I urged you to stay in Ephesus so that you would confront the false teachers and that so you would teach the truth. And here's the thing, though. You could take this principle and simply say, not only does Satan look forward to us dropping our guard, but he loves to take our lives and sidetrack us off the straight and narrow. You know, that, that phrase, straight and narrow, that might sound old-fashioned, but you know, it really works. It's really true. The other night, Linda and I were trying a road, and we had never been down it before, and, and we came to a T-junction, and there were no signs. We didn't know which way to go. Do we go right? Do we go left? And so we realized that we didn't know which way we were supposed to go. We were, well, we weren't quite lost, because I knew we could turn around and go back to, from where we had started. But I also know that not only when we drop our guard is that dangerous, but I also know that if we drop our guard, the next thing Satan loves to do with us is to sidetrack us away from what God has called us to be. And that's what Paul's saying to Timothy here. He's saying, Timothy, God has created you to be something. God has even gifted you to be something. Whatever you do, don't allow things, don't allow people to enter your life to take you away from the direction that God has called you and created you to be. And the same thing is true if for those of us, if we've grown up in the church, if we've been taught the Word of God, if we have learned what the Bible teaches, but then we allow ourselves to drop our guard, and then we, we go off that straight and narrow path which leads to life, I believe, and instead we go off that path, almost like that book, Pilgrim's Progress, we find ourselves getting into trouble. But the problem is that oftentimes what I see is, is that when people go off the path, after a while, at first they realize they, their conscience kind of works at them. They know that what they're doing is wrong, but because they continue in it, after a while they begin to convince themselves that what they first realized was wrong, they now begin to believe it's okay. And oftentimes it's because the people who are surrounding them aren't believers themselves. Don't themselves believe in the teachings of the Word of God. Don't believe that it's important to obey God. And so as they go off the path, they begin then, as they're off the path, begin to meet other people who are also off the path and then begin to speak in their lives and say, well, you know, what you're doing, that's okay, because I do that too, and doesn't everyone else do that? Paul's warning Timothy, Timothy, don't drop your guard, because if you do, it's going to take you in the wrong direction. But instead, he says, what, at the end of verse 18, but fight the good fight. And that command to fight is, is a present tense kind of command word, which basically means the battle's never going to stop. It's never going to stop. There isn't a day in the week where we're not going to be tempted. And if we ever begin to convince ourselves that the fight's going to end or the fight has ended, in my, let me tell you, the fight is always going to be there. And sometimes 
the enemy will work in ways that will surprise you. He'll use relationships to get at you. He'll use jobs. He'll use careers. He'll use the toys in our lives, to, the allure of these things to capture our attention, to take us away from God. One of the areas that Satan goes after is not only in fighting the good fight, but Paul mentions there, so that you can keep the faith and a good conscience. What does Satan go after? He goes after the, your faith. He goes after what you've been taught to believe. That, that he, he goes after your good conscience. You know, in other words, he seeks to destroy what God has created good in you through Jesus Christ, and instead he whittles and he works his way into your life, and so that you get to a place where you sit before God, and, you, and, and, and if you're going to be honest and transparent before God, you, you, know, you, you say, to, you know what, God, I don't have a clean conscience. I know, God, I'm, I'm living a lie. But the thing, and why it's so dangerous is because I have seen it over and over again, because when you go off that path, like I said, there will be other people, though, who will be there to meet you. But they won't be people that you want to church with, hopefully. But more likely, there are going to be people who are not a part of God's church, who don't, when they come before the Word of God, they just say, ah, you know, it's a book. When you talk about Jesus Christ, they may not even believe in Him. You see, when we do this to ourselves, if we allow ourselves to become deluded, we begin to believe that what we're doing is okay. And that's the greatest danger. And that's why it used to be called years ago the slippery slide. Because once you get on that slide, you take off. And boy, does it go fast. And before you know it, you end up ruining your life. And why is that true? Well, in the second half of verse 19 and 20, Paul, who tells Timothy, not only don't drop your guard, because if you do, this is what the enemy is going to do to you. But then I really believe the second half of verse 19 illustrates for us, it tells us, and I think that what Paul's really saying here is, look at the tragedy who has, that has come upon other people who have dropped their guard. Now, some of you even right now, if not in your own life, you can think of people you've known. And you say to yourself, you know, I, I just, I can't imagine what that person did to themselves because they dropped their guard. And in, and in contrast, Paul says to Timothy, he says, look, which have some have rejected and have shuff, suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. And then he goes on to say, and among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered over to Satan so that they may be taught not to blaspheme. When I was a boy, I might have told this story once before a while back, but <clears throat> when I was a boy, there was a man in our church that led the youth ministry. This was back in, you know, 60s, 70s. There were, there were no such things as youth pastors. You know, he didn't, you know it, people in the church, they just basically did everything. This man uh, served the Lord. He led the youth ministry in the church. He, he, he became almost famous for it because... It, dynamic, large youth ministry, lots of kids, lots of teens were affected by his life. Great, great guy. They lived in a really tiny house, he and his wife and his daughter. And being a dad and a father, and being a guy that was good with his hands, he decided to build a bigger house for his family. Nothing wrong with that. But he began to build this house, and over time, this house began to take over his life. The house began to be, it, be, it became a preoccupation. And over time, he began, he, well, he had to give up the youth ministry, and, and then he wasn't coming to church so much, and then eventually he wasn't coming to church at all. In fact, eventually he just wasn't going to church anywhere. But he was building his house for his family. And then once he finished building his house for his family, he was still nowhere to be seen, at least not around church, not around Christian people, not around his friends, not around the people that used to look up to him so much. But he was gone. You see, without even knowing it, if you think about it, 
He started out trying to do something that was good. Help his family. And the goal seemed like a worthy goal, to build a bigger house for his family. But that worthy good goal eventually, through Satan's tactics, became an open door where he dropped his spiritual guard. And his house, in effect, became his God. Because that became the center of his life and his attention. And I'm glad to say that Many, many, many years later, he finally came back to the Lord after he had dropped his guard. But Paul, referring to people like this, says to Timothy, Timothy, here's why I want you to hang in and fight the good fight, because there are people who have rejected the faith, and in the process, they have shipwrecked their faith. Now, I'm not going to be theological about this. But what he's really saying here is, he's saying, Timothy, there are good Christian people who used to cook the breakfast for the men's breakfast. There used to be good guys who led Bible studies in the church. There used to be women that took up the offerings or led ladies' programs. But for whatever reason, they dropped their guard and the enemy worked his way in. And in the process, he not only ruined their lives spiritually, but he shipwrecked even their faith. You know what oftentimes happens, and this is almost if Satan's doing this to you, look out, be warned. But what often happens, why you sometimes see people drift away from church is because they get to a place where because they know they're not living for Christ, they almost can't stand coming into church on Sunday because they know that they're going to feel convicted. And I don't know if you're in that place this morning, but I want to warn you, don't give in and listen to the enemy. Because the place where you need to be is in the place that convicts you. The place you need to be in is the place that calls to you out from the straight and narrow road that leads to life and says, you've become lost, you've wandered off the path. This is the way back. Hear the voice of Christ. The Bible says that a broken and contrite heart, that's what God is looking for. And that's what God is calling out to you today and is saying, God, 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 I have wandered so far. Father God, forgive me. Let me come back and be as close to you as I once was. You know, what Paul's talking about here is about people who shipwreck their lives, ruin their lives. And can you imagine in verse 20, he names names? Could you imagine if, if verse 20 said Craig or Dan? That for at least now the next 2,000 years, when people gather in church and they study through 1 Timothy, they're going to read about Dan and Craig, about how they shipwrecked their faith. When he talks about Alexander and Hymenaeus, I, I have no doubt he's talking about two fellows in that church, in that area, and he's saying to them, you remember those two guys, the things that they did, the offering, the counting the money, maybe they were deacons or elders or Bible teachers or whatever they did, do you remember those two guys? Well they, well, they shipwrecked their lives, and because of that, I've had to give them over to Satan. Now, that might sound radical to be given over to Satan, but I'll tell you what Paul's really saying. He's saying, these guys are in such a miserable condition. First off, they may not even realize themselves what they've done to themselves. Do you know people like that? That they're living in sin, and they don't even, they don't, they're, they're so lost in it. And he says, so therefore I've given them over to Satan because because if I give them over to him, he will take them where they will eventually go. And that's to the bottom of the barrel. He will take them into the gutter. And he will ruin their lives. And Paul says, and and I'm going to allow and and, and I'm going to allow that to happen. Why? Because maybe they'll be like the prodigal son 
who one day woke up in the pigsty and said, this really stinks. You see, there's this place where unfortunately at times that God has to take us because we're not listening. Because we've become like an unbeliever. We have allowed our eyes to be blinded. We have covered our ears. We've allowed other things to enter our lives to take us away from God. And I imagine that God looks at those circumstances and says, okay, the only way I'm going to bring this one back is to allow them to hit the bottom of that barrel. The only way I'm going to be able to bring this one back is to let them lie there in the gutter and see how rotten it is and see how stinky that is. And hopefully, hopefully, that will be the very thing that wakes that person up. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? After he asked his daddy for his money, he went off, he squandered it, spent it all, found, him out, found himself down and out, went to wherever he could go and ended up in that pigsty with the hogs, right? But then while he was there, not only did he say, boy, this stinks, <laughs> but he remembered his daddy back home. And he remembered how good it was. You see, in a way, spiritually speaking, that's what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. That when we've fallen into sin, when we've allowed ourselves, when we've dropped our guard and we've allowed ourselves to get off the straight and narrow, hopefully God will bring us to the place where we'll think back and we'll say, you know, life was actually a whole lot better when I was living for God. You know, mom and dad were right, and I'm wrong. You know, God, I've made a mess of my life, and I need to get right with you. If we would close our eyes and bow our heads. I'm just going to take a few moments here. I'm not going to pray yet, but I'm going to ask you to pray, just between you and the Lord. And as you're before the Lord right now, where are you with the Lord? For some of you, are you in danger this weekend? Of dropping your guard? If so, before God, look over the cliff and think about how far down it goes. If you're married and you're being tempted outside your marriage, is it really worth losing that relationship? If you're single, has Satan deluded your mind and taken you off the path? Is pride keeping you from saying to God, God, I have sinned. Please forgive me. And you know what? He will. I'm not going to ask for anyone to raise their hand today. 
I don't want to embarrass anyone. But I do want you to be in a right relationship with God. Father, I have seen far too many times how the enemy not only would want to ruin my own life and ruin my own testimony, but I just get disgusted when I see how often he has had that opportunity to do it with others and particularly with those that I love. And it would break my heart, Lord, today to go from this message and to think that someone who has been presented with the truth this morning would still not come to the truth and confess their sin. But I do know one thing, Lord, that if they do confess their sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Father, if there are any here today in the service who right now before you have done just that, have cried out and have said, God, I swallow my pride today. What I've been doing is not only wrong, it is sinful. And I confess my sin, God, and I ask you to forgive me. If that's you, my friend, there are words that the Lord Jesus spoke that are words that you need to hear. Then if that's your prayer, then hear what the Savior said. Go and sin no more. Don't be the prodigal who wants leaving the pigsty decides to go back. The book of Proverbs says a dog returns to its own vomit. And as ugly as a picture of that is in our minds, that is what we're doing to ourselves when we confess our sin, but then just as quickly go back to it. It's like eating vomit. And Father, I pray for all of us because we are in a fight for the very spiritual vitality of our lives that if any of us are feeling tempted to drop our guard or have dropped our guard and have allowed the enemy a foothold in our lives, that we would call out to you, Lord, with broken and contrite hearts, and that we would plead with you to forgive us and to restore us. And I know, Lord God, because your word promises that where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And that, Lord God, is a point of encouragement because there is nothing better in life than to experience the super abounding grace of God. And so, Lord, I pray that there would not be one heart in this sanctuary this morning, not one heart, Lord, that would turn away from you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.